I had to leave. So, um, okay, I hope everything works. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll get into introducing Gary a bit later, but um, this is an area that a lot of you are familiar with. A lot of you have been in uh, camping here to go to Macaw Days, but uh, the, these sites are uh, um, gonna be discussed from along the coast. And uh, 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 this one had some similarities to Hoko at 3,000 years ago, and he'll talk about that too, which is pretty interesting. Um, let's see if this, some good news. Uh, I think we might have some weavers here. I know Steph Stephanie Peterson was gonna come in. Are you in Stephanie from Minia Bay? But, um, Ed Carrier got a, a, a residency at the Bloedel Reserve in uh, <laughs> Island in kind of a small Bruchard Gardens, but it's beautiful. Uh, maybe even Gary uh, and uh, we'll, we'll I'm, Bailey, I'm sorry. Anyway, you can call them at the Bloedel Reserve and get more information. And focusing on these clam baskets. But uh, more good news. Um, my granddaughter just turned a year old a couple of days ago. Uh, and the best part was she was born two weeks early. As you know, this is the one year anniversary of things really in uh, uh, the COVID uh, shutdown began. Uh, but she's two weeks early. So she actually was uh, uh, born in the hospital before they really had to restrict a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we do have all of uh, the past talks on our uh, YouTube channel uh, and it's in the newsletter, the, the link. So if you want to go back and see talks like uh, Vic Cacera's uh, draft or movie in this case on the Shayla's River Hypothesis, it's there. Uh, next talk this spring is uh, on Ice Age Migration and Settlement along uh, the Northwest Coast of North America by uh, Dr. James Dixon from the University of New Mexico. Uh, he's well known for his work in Alaska and early sites, even offshore work. Um, and uh, On Your Knee Cave uh, is involved with that. Uh, but. Uh, That'll be May 6th, so put it on your calendar. As you know, we've been doing, uh, um, we've got a grant actually from the Squaxin Island tribe. Uh, I'm about to do a report for their newsletter, but uh, the grant was to uh, seek out megafauna, uh, particularly mammoths and mastodons and uh, consider dating them if they have any marks that appear could be human. Uh, and uh, uh, we did today get a date from this leg bone of a, a mammoth that. Uh, okay, uh, hold on. What's that? Dave, Dave uh, Rice, one of our members, uh, we were at uh, the Cowlitz County uh, Museum, Historical Museum, uh, and uh, for the, the dating. Uh, Jim Chatters is uh, the archaeologist with uh, direct uh, mm. AMS. So he, he, we do have a, a website where you can help oh. uh, to help us to to collect, you know, to 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 get funds. We're about to go to some other museums. We have an intern at Evergreen that'll be uh, tracking down regional museums. Uh, in fact, this 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 uh, connection was through a uh, evergreen uh, intern we had last year. Uh, two teeth were sampled too, uh, and uh, direct AMS is is interested in seeing how it, how well the dating goes on those. So they're going to date those two mammoth teeth, which were found around uh, more on the Chehalis drainage. This bone is actually at Rocky Point on the uh, uh, Calus drainage near in Kelso. But 
So we'll, we'll end up with three days, but two gratis because uh, Jim and uh, Direct AMS want to look at that. We're also looking at the artifacts that they have. This is a classic stem point. Uh, we're really looking for the stem point tradition throughout the Chehalish drainage too as an earlier tradition than, uh, or, or thought to be earlier than Clovis. Um, here's the, the letter I got today or the report from direct AMS and uh, Pat may be able to help me, but it, I originally reported this, that the uh, radiocarbon age at about 15,000, 14,929. And uh, Jim did some calibration on it today. I asked him to see where it came out in this uh, leg bone. They took a sample out of this broken area actually dates most likely to about 18,200. Uh, so it's at the maximum of glaciation in our area. If you're in Seattle, you'd be under about a mile of ice right, right now if you're there at this time. And uh, so it just shows you how uh, some of this megafauna was pretty prosperous down below the major glacier areas in, in the Chehalis College drainage. Um, and so this, this is what uh, Pat did. Did you want to say something about your nice, your chart here that day? Yeah, well, this, this is um, a calibration plot from the program OxCal, which is uh, available online if you want to, it's run out of the Oxford University Radiocarbon Lab. And it, so you, you plug in on the left side of the, of the, of the chart here, the y-axis is the raw lab age than 14,929 plus the error associated with it, plus or minus 48. And then what you do is you take that whole error over to the calibration curve, which really is a plot of, of uh, carbon 14 in the atmosphere over time. And um, in other words, you can't just use the straight uh, uh, 5,730 years half-life of radiocarbon. You actually have to see how it checks out with the carbon 14 in the atmosphere over time. So once you find where it intersects the calibration curve, which is put together by either tree rings or in this case, lake deposits, uh, then this gives you the possibly hot, most likely calendar dates, actual dates. And there is one small, very low chance, less than 2% that it's a little bit older than that. But I put these three probabilities here, the sigma one through sigma three, which is, you know, 68%, but at 99.7% probability, it's between eight, 18,623 years and 18,319 years. So that would be this right here. 95% chance that it's 18,570 and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, thank, thanks so much. But uh, I'm looking at my cursor realizing you can't see my cursor because I'm not giving the presentation. But in any case, I hope that what I said makes sense. But uh, just to keep the, this in context, the, um, the Manus Mastodon age of about 13,800 and the Paisley Caves date of about 14,000 and whatever it was, those are both calibrated already. Those are not raw cal ages. So, um, it's always important to do the calibration and talk about it in calibrated terms. Definitely, because and the new, more... by the way, the new, unfortunately this happened right after my presentation on uh, the tan wax flood and the, and the Puget lobe. But about a, three weeks later, I got a, an email from Ralph Hagerud at the USGS and he's redated the Puget lobe to arriving in, in uh, the Southern Puget Lowland about 16,000 years ago. And he has a, to a new paper out. It's, it hasn't been published yet, but it's gonna be in a Geologic Society of America special volume that's dedicated to Steve Porter up at UW. So uh, I had heard about these younger ages on the Puget Lobe for years. And apparently now they're, they're putting them down in stone that that's what it is. So uh, the Puget Lobe arrived you know, down around, got as far as maybe Maytown, uh, the Ice Age glacier that, you know, came down between the, the Olympics and the, uh, the Cascade Range, probably reached its maximum somewhere around 16,000 years ago, which is a thousand years later than the, the first uh, dates they had of 17,000. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Jim points it out here that really we, had, you know, Ayers Pond and Manis and uh, and Paisley talks we've had uh, really don't get into what we thought we were getting into, but it's even much later actually. Um, Pat, any more, that, that had nothing to do with the draining to what the dates they were getting for draining Puget, uh, Lake Russell and uh, out to the Straits? No, I don't know. I, I don't know what Ralph's data is on the draining of Lake Russell, um, but Lake Russell would have begun to form sometime, you know, right after the maximum of the Puget Lobe. So sometime after 16,000. Okay, that actually helps. Well, thank you. Any other comments? I don't know if Gary's certainly familiar with some of this. Okay, um, well, Gary uh, and I both worked at Ozette uh, for our PhD work and, uh, and his was quite consequential because it was on the uh, the shellfish uh, remains from the from the site and he tabulated and worked with over 300,000 examples uh, of 90 species from the site. I think he's partly best known for his major uh, revisiting and surveying throughout uh, Puget Sound, the San Juans and uh, and the and, and, and really helping the, the uh, updating of what the sites are like in terms of that, as well as you can see up the straits and, and revisiting them, many of these sites and actually excavating those as well. Um, and uh, so we're really lucky to, to have him have this kind of uh, detail on a number of, of these sites. Uh, he, he, since the 80s, he's had uh, his own consulting company and it's always been recognized as very well, doing very well, uh, Wesson and Associates. And, uh, and uh, so uh, anyway, a lot of people have used his work from Ozet in terms of their fauna work. And he's worked with the other fauna as well. And he's really quite involved with shellman studies. Uh, Okay, I uh, did want to point out, he'll talk about this, but this one site, which is up the Suyas, right, Gary? That's the Suyas. Yeah, yeah it's the Suyas, but I'm not really going to talk about it that much tonight. <laughs> What's that? I'm not really talking too much about the older sites uh, tonight. I'm really... uh, that's okay, but I uh, where we've connected, because... You know, he had a big vein quartz bipolar technology showing up at about the same time period we see it out at Hoko, but actually halved it as fish knives in that wet site. Um, and he's one of the few researchers that really have looked at the basketry data and said, well, you know, that uh, complements some of the hypotheses I've been working on in terms of the uh, uh, long-term continuity of uh, macaw in the area, you know, being longer than a, some thinking, you know, being very recently coming, macaws coming across from Vancouver Island. It appears that from Hoko, the basketry uh, is very similar to Ozette and it's these kinds of pack bags and, and the knob top hats were, uh, you know, uh, quite similar over that 3,000 year old time period to OZET. So my statistics shows uh, <clears throat> hypothetically that these people are uh, generationally linked through time versus mm -hmm. what we see down in uh, Puget Sound, Gulf of Georgia, uh, which has its own very distinct style for at least the same time period. Uh, new work I've just done also complements that idea. It's on cordage. <sighs> coming out with an OZET cordage update. Hi, buddy. What's that? <laughs> and knots too. Um, it's, you know, and it complements to the, the basketry, but we use Bayesian uh, 
trees and they they start off at 5,000 years and they're time calibrated, which makes it kind of nice. And again, it complements, it shows 3,000 years at Hoko, always very close to the 300 year old uh, Ozette. And then the Puget Sound Gulf of Georgia, uh, all connecting in a, in a different part of, of that uh, new, st new kind of way of testing things temporally as well. Uh, again, this shows Hoko to Ozette and, and we, I consider it Wakashan uh, and Gary will talk about, well, we don't, you know, everybody says, well, what if it's Chamakuan? Well, um, we need some wet sites there, but it, it comes across as, uh, as, as something very distinct in that area. Uh, so with that, I, I'd like to turn it over to, to Gary uh, and uh, really look forward to this presentation. So okay, thank well, you, Gary. Thank you, Dale. Um, Should be able to share just fine. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, and let me get this up here. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, okay. Let me start with just a couple of introductory remarks. And the presentation that I'm going to give tonight is, is largely uh, something that was prepared uh, for the presentation at the Macaw Museum almost two years ago. And it's based on a paper that I published in Jonah, uh, Journal of Northwest Anthropology in 2019. And it's really focused on the, the, some questions about the the relatively recent pre-contact history of the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula is the area that Dale has shown. And I'll review that again to begin with. And, and really what I wanted to focus on in this paper uh, initially uh, was uh, looking at the, the idea that macaws are relatively recent on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, uh, it's been argued that they're as recent as a thousand years and that the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula prior to that time was actually Chamaqua territory held by the Quileute people. And uh, in addition to kind of reviewing what's in that paper, uh, Steve Samuels and I kind of following up on that paper uh, began to explore the idea a little further and look at uh, faunal assemblages from the region and particularly with the idea or that we might be able to tell the difference between Macaw and Quileute shell midden sites based on the faunal assemblages. Uh, and so, uh, and I'll show you some of that data as well, but I want to emphasize a couple of things here first off. Uh, Steve and I have actually are continuing on this very same research on the faunal assemblages. Uh, and so the numbers that you're going to see in the tables I'm going to show you tonight are really uh, from more than a year ago. We really haven't incorporated the more recent data because, uh, frankly, we've had difficulty pursuing this work over the last year, given the pandemic and it's restricted our access to collections that we want to work with. Uh, we have several more funnel assemblages from outer coast sites that uh, we hope to be able to add to this database. And we've been working, reworking some of the numbers. So in some of the tables I'm gonna show you in the second half of this presentation, uh, the numbers are gonna change a little bit in the final presentation and hopeful publication of it. But, but the trends I think that you'll see in these tables are, 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 will still be very much intact in the final version. And, and let me say also that uh, I want to explore both the origins of these ideas prior to our own recent work on it and some of the ideas that we're looking at now, but particularly for the ideas that we're looking at now, uh, we don't claim that we've actually proven anything yet. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, at best, we are hoping to propose some new ideas that uh, can be tested in the future when data sets better than the ones that are available now actually become available. So we're really proposing models for subsequent testing rather than asserting that we have definitively shown something. Um, okay, with those kind of caveats in mind, uh, let's um, do some introductory things and actually um, 
the introductory stuff I was just telling you about should have been on that slide. So let's move on a little more than that. Uh, this is the area that we're talking about. Uh, it's the same graphic that Dale used earlier. It's from the Jonah paper. Uh, the Hoko is right here. This is the Macaw Reservation. OZ is here. Uh, La Push and the Quilly Reservation is here. And the area that we're covering it extends from about Hoko down south to the vicinity of Toliak Point, which is in this area. Uh, and, and I should also emphasize that uh, the, I'm only gonna be talking about shellman deposits in this area. And most of the recorded sites in this area are actually coastal shellmans. There are a few interior sites, not very many, but a couple or one or two have actually been looked at, but they're really not part of this presentation. So we're pretty much just talking about shellmans. And for people if you're not familiar Area. This is a rugged outer coast area uh, with a intact old growth forest. This is an aerial photograph of Rosette, uh, Cape Lava. In fact, the excavations are in this area. And this is typical of much of the area. Uh, the only real variations from that are places where we have rocky cliffs along the shoreline. Uh, there are not many large rivers that come out of the coast in this area. Uh, this is a picture of a push. Uh, and the Quileute Reservation. And this is the largest single system that actually comes out to the shoreline anywhere on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula. Uh, with respect to the tribal territories that we're talking about, this is a map that was put together by Rajram Singh in the 1960s. Uh, he split Macaw from Ozette and Quileute and Ho for our purposes this evening going to lump Macaw and Ozette together and Quileute and Ho basically come together. And I think you can see quite clearly, first, if you just look at this map here, that there are some really distinct differences in the territories of these two groups. Uh, uh, in Macaw territory, there are approximately 20 ethnographically, ethnographically identified uh, settlements, uh, both winter villages and seasonal camps, and all of them are on marine shorelines. Uh, there are no large rivers in Macaw territory. This is the Suez here, there's the Hoko there, but these are really relatively small streams. And this is in sharp contrast to Quileute and Ho territory, uh, which has a, almost the same amount of marine shoreline, but their territory, Quileute in particular, includes the entire Quileute watershed. It includes the, the, uh, the Saldak, the Kalawa, the Bogashiel, uh, and the Dickey. And these are the, some of the largest rivers on the Western Olympic Peninsula and the Ho here as well. And, and if you look at the settlement distribution in Kulia territory, you can see it's actually very, very different from Macaw territory. I told you there are about 20 recorded sites here. They're all on the coast. There are more than 45 Quileute and Ho recorded ethnographic settlements. And perhaps 70% of them are actually located up these river valleys. Uh, only about a third of them are actually coastal sites. And in fact, in Ho territory, there's really only two coastal sites. So uh, the Quileute and Ho people occupied river valleys as much as 20 miles inland. Um, in terms of just demographics, uh, early historic uh, estimates of population levels are actually early 20th century stuff by uh, Mooney suggest that there were uh, in late pre-contact times, perhaps as many as 2,000 macaws and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five, 600 quileus. And, and if you just think about the, the, those population numbers and the number of settlements, it's fair to infer that at least some of the macaw sites are likely to have been much larger than quileute sites, just given the amount of people who actually occupy uh, individual settlements. Uh, another thing that's different here that is important to our work is both of these people moved on seasonal rounds, moved seasonally between uh, so-called winter villages, which are really multi-season villages. In fact, it's, it's unlikely that in any of these large multi-season villages were totally abandoned at any time of year. But, but Macaw people moved from one place on the coast to some other place on the coast. Quileutes 
moved between the interior and the coast, uh, some population uh, estimates suggest as much as 70% of the Quileute population in late prehistoric times was actually associated with these upriver villages in the coastal river valleys. And these are people who moved out to the coast in the spring and summer to, to, to uh, collect beach and marine resources, and then returned to the interior uh, in the fall to take fit salmon out of riverine traps and spent the winter up in the interior. There's also, in fact, some uh, reason to believe that some of that there was a coastally based population representing a smaller part of the Quileutes uh, that actually moved into the interior in the spring, in the summer, late summer, to hunt deer and elk uh, and collect interior resources. So the Quileutes have this real interior to coastal movement back and forth, where its cause are pretty much out on the the coast year-round. Uh, in terms of language families, we have two very distinct groups. Macaws are uh, speak a Wakashan language that's closely related to Dittada, and Dittada are the people who in our earlier historic records are described as Nitnats. Uh, and, uh, and they all spoke New Chan, all third Nitkin languages on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and were somewhat more distantly related to the Kwakutl languages of northeastern Vancouver Island. Quileute is a Chimacum language that's closely related to uh, Chimacuan language, closely related to Chimacums, and those are people who lived in northeastern uh, Olympic Peninsula. And well, linguists have some ideas about distant remote relationships between Chimacum and other languages, possibly even a distant relationship to Wakashan. Uh, it's not closely related to any other language family. It's really a, a language isolate. Okay, let's talk about the ideas that Quileutes uh, are uh, occupied the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula prior to the Macaw arrival and that the Macaw arrival was, was quite recent. And, and actually most of these ideas come from linguists rather than archeologists. But what I wanna kind of briefly go through and give you a sense of is Albert Reagan in 1917 actually uh, first suggested the idea that Quileutes predated macaws on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and nobody really did much with this idea until the 1970s when Dale Kincaid and Jay Powell, who are both linguists, uh, published a paper argue, uh, supporting the idea that Quileutes were there earlier and proposed the idea that, uh, that macaws arrived as recently as a thousand years ago. Uh, Powell continued to pursue the, the claim as recently as 2015 that macaws are recent, uh, around a thousand years. And in a paper that Powell wrote, actually comments on my 19, uh, 2019 paper, uh, Powell still argued that he thought that macaws were relatively recent uh, and that Quileutes were there prior to macaws but expanded the time frame out to possibly as much as 2000 years. Okay, let's, and let's look at these a little bit. Uh, this is Albert Reagan, uh, and Albert Reagan wrote a paper in the California Academy of Sciences in uh, 1917. That's really the first actual archeological discussion for sites in this area. Uh, James Swan earlier was aware that there were archeological sites here, but he didn't ever really talk about them. And Reagan is an interesting character. I don't know how many of your, your members are, are aware of him. Uh, Reagan uh, wrote about the, some of the first papers about the geology of the Olympic Peninsula. He wrote some ethnographic descriptions and he wrote a paper about the archeology span of this region. Um, but Reagan had no formal training as an archeologist, uh, either at the time that he was at La Push, he was a school teacher at La Push. And he was there from 1905 to 1909. So among other things, uh, this paper was written eight years after he worked at La Push. And this paper proposes a number of interesting ideas, but is really short on data or explanations on how it is he happened to come to know these things. And, and I can tell you that in an effort to better understand Reagan's work, I've actually reviewed more than 400 pages of Reagan manuscript material related to his archeological ideas. Uh, much of this data, uh, the, the manuscripts are at, at Brigham Young University, the Smithsonian has some. And there's nothing in, in all the literature, the manuscript material that I've looked at that actually describes his archeological archeological techniques, what he did, 
even what sites he dug at. The only site that we know for sure that he dug at was at La Push. But he proposes things and describes things in this paper that suggests that he dug in numerous other places. And, and without going into a lot of the other issues that Reagan talks about, Reagan proposed a cultural chronology for the two regions based on archeological assemblages. And you see it summarized here. Uh, and the terms he used were not uncommon at the time. And I could tell you without describing them in great detail, which really can't be done because he didn't describe them in great detail. Uh, the recent assemblages for both Ozet Mackay and Quileute are basically the same as the old ones, except that they have historic, historic material in them. And so they clearly date to the 19th century. Um, and the ancient uh, ones in Quileute are similar to the very old ones. I, he basically suggested that the very old deposits were like the Quileute stuff. And then he described a, a third prehistoric assembly very briefly, which he, uh, which he called ancient, that is different from the Quileute ancient. And he suggested that this was Quileute. Uh, he didn't really describe the ancient assemblage very well. He doesn't describe any of them, but he did suggest that the ancient assemblage was reminiscent of assemblages further to the north. And he didn't really specify where to the north he was talking about. And so basically, this is this is my breakdown of, of how that sort of works out. And like I say, he sees an equivalence between this and that. Uh, OK, um, so and, and he also cited uh, ethnographic stories, uh, traditional stories of the Quileute that suggested that they were the original people on, uh, on uh, the Olympic Peninsula. This idea really didn't get much attention by anybody uh, after 1917 until 1976. And then uh, Kincaid and Powell produced this paper in a, in a volume called World Archaeology. And, and actually, uh, this one is cited a bit about the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula, but I think if people haven't read it, the paper is really about the application of linguistics to prehistory in North America. And it's really about the use of glottochronology, which was a technique uh, developed by linguists in 1950 that purported to be able to date the temporal ranges for related languages. Uh, I'm not really going to describe glottochronology in much detail here. Perhaps some of you are familiar with it. Um, the idea was very popular in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, it kind of fell out of favor by the 1980s and is now largely discredited. And I don't think there are any linguists, certainly on the Northwest Coast, using it anymore. But the idea was around for, for like I say, for a while. And, and among other things, Ken Ken and Powell never talk about Reagan's uh, ideas in 1917, even though Ken Ken and Powell offer similar ideas. Uh, Ken Ken and Powell offer three kinds of evidence, they believe, uh, for their claim that Macaws are quite recent and this was formerly fully of territory. Uh, they refer to place name data, what they call Chamakwin comparative linguistics and what they refer to as the mythic corpora of Macaw and Quileutes. And just quickly to give you some sense of what these things were about. Uh, for place names, uh, they argued that place names in Macaw territory are actually Quileute words. And that this is evidence that, uh, that Quileutes formerly occupied these places and that when Macaws moved into the territory, they continued to use the older place names. And I have to tell you, first off, uh, I'm not a linguist. Uh, and I can tell you that linguists who work with the Macaw language uh, hotly dispute the claim that these, these place names here, there's eight of them, and you can see Hoko is one of them. Uh, the Macaw linguists certainly dispute this entire contention and claim that these are not Quileute words. These are perf perfectly good Macaw words. Uh, honestly, I don't have an independent opinion on that subject. Uh, and I understand that 
general character of the argument about the use of place names. But I think we need to be really cautious about actually using place names as in, uh, to indicate whose traditional territory it was. Uh, in fact, I would argue that just about at any time in world history, it's quite likely that at least some individuals of any ethnic group had some knowledge of places beyond their traditional territory and had names for those places in their own language. As a matter of fact, Macaws have place names in the Macaw language for Vancouver Island, uh, for Seattle, uh, for the Columbia River, and for that matter, for the moon, uh, none of which are actually in Macaw territory. So for myself, this is not a very strong argument. And I would further add that, well, uh, Kincaid and Powell's argument is based on eight place names. Macaws have more than 250 place names for places in their territory. So it's a really tiny sample. And I have to tell you that for me at least, this, this is not a very convincing argument. Uh, what Kincaid and Powell call Tremaquian comparative linguistics is basically glottochronology. Uh, and again, this is a technique that purports to be able to tell the, uh, the age and temporal separation uh, of related languages. And in that paper, they compared Quileute to Chimacuan, the two Chimacum languages on the Olympic Peninsula, and suggests that the separation occurred between 1,000 and 2,000 years ago. Uh, more recently, in Powell's response to my paper, he acknowledged not only that glottochronology is a questionable technique, but he also acknowledged that there's almost no really good reliable language data for the Chimacum language. Chimicum's disappeared by about the 1850s. There's only very, very limited language data for them. And, and so I think that analysis is questionable just based on the, the Chimicum data that they're actually using. And, and in the 76 paper, they actually made this statement. They said, it's altogether possible that Chimicum split long before the arrival of the Nootkins with Quileute and Chimicum representing ends of a continuum of Chimicum communities or neighbors who were forced further apart when newcomers settled between them. So to my mind, they, uh, you know, they, they've kind of walked away from this, that even if this temporal estimate is good, that it may have nothing to do with the arrival of, of, of Nutkins. And just to uh, give you a small graphic here, here's the Quileu territory. Chimicums are over here. And, and macaws aren't actually between the two of them, if we look at the traditional range of where macaws are. So honestly, I don't find this argument to be very, very convincing or compelling either. Um, the third type of uh, evidence that they cite in, in that paper, they call the mythic corpora of Macaw and Quileute. Uh, and I have to tell you, they clearly represent these stories as being potentially oral history, which is kind of, at least from my point of view, discounted by the term mythic. But anyway, they cite three different traditional stories as in support of their evidence that macaws were there earlier, uh, that, that coolies were there earlier. They first off note that macaws have contradictory origin stories recorded. And, and the two stories that they refer to is macaws have some stories that claim that they were <laughs> always in the Cape Flattery area. And the macaws also have a story about uh, being descended from a group of, uh, from a woman who lived in Nitnat on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island, who gave birth to some dogs, the children that were puppies. And she was expelled from Nitnat with her puppy children and came across to the Nia Bay area. And after they arrived at Nia Bay, uh, the, the children threw off the dog costumes and were in fact human children. And, uh, and that they became the macaws. And to me, uh, as I read that story, I don't think that these stories are actually contradictory because what I get out of the, the, the so-called dog children story is, is that there was never actually a self-identified group of people call themselves macaws on Vancouver Island. Macaws only come into their own self-identity as macaws 
once they're in the Cape Flattery area. Uh, and in fact, I would point out that Macaw is not really their name for themselves. It's a Salish name for them. And that uh, the Macaw name for themselves, and I apologize to any Macaw listeners with my pronunciation, but uh, the Macaw name for themselves is Kodischa'a, or something phonetically close to that. And that means people of the Cape, and it's a clear reference to Cape Flattery. So I would argue that, in fact, these stories are not actually contradictory. Uh, Powell uh, and uh, Kincaid and Powell then point to a story that was recorded in the 1920s about how the macaws got tattooed island in Nia Bay. And in that story, uh, it occurs at a time when Nitnat people from Vancouver Island held tattoo island in Nia Bay and had a war <laughs> with the macaws. But that story clearly uh, represents that the macaws who fought the Nitnats who held uh, Tatouche Island and Nia Bay were from Suez and Wyatch and from Ozette, all traditional villages on Cape Flattery. So that story is not about macaws arriving uh, in the Cape Flattery area. They're clearly already in residence there when that story occurs. And by the way, that story has nothing to do with Kuliuts one way or the other. The other group that it, it cites is another group of Wakashian speakers from Vancouver Island, not Quileutes. And finally, Kincaid and Powell cite a story that, uh, that uh, Leo Frachtenberg recorded and later translated by Manuel Andrade, uh, in which the Quileutes claim that they've always been where they are. But, but that story does not specify where they are talking about when they say they've always been where they are. So none of these stories actually place the Quileutes on the Cape Flattery area. And, and just, just finishing up the oral history stuff, uh, I would uh, point out that some of the stories about the Quileutes really contradict uh, Kincaid and Powell's ideas. Uh, Reagan tells a story about Quileutes saying that they used to be much more widespread on the Olympic Peninsula. But that story specifically says that Quileute's former held the area from the mouth of the Hoko River eastward all the way beyond the Elwha and does not include the Cape Flattery area. So that story does not is does not support them. Uh, Andrade also has a story about how Quileute's and Chimacums became separated. And that story says they were separated by a great flood that frankly, some people have interpreted as a tsunami. They don't say that the Quileutes came. Um, and Reagan does have some accounts that actually place Quileutes on the, in, the, in what is Macaw territory now, but those are stories that did not appear until the 1930s, which is more than 20 years uh, after Reagan was at La Push. And Powell himself has acknowledged going through the, the manuscript materials that Reagan's actual notes on these stories are extremely cursory and don't really provide, a, you know, that, uh, that, that Reagan kind of fleshed out these stories decades later. So I would argue that none of these stories are particularly compelling. Um, so given that background, what I wanted to do first off was kind of look at the available archaeological data from the region because frankly, there wasn't very much archaeological data in 1976 when Kincaid and Pell wrote their paper, but quite a bit more is available now. And at least try to get a sense of, well, how, how does the existing data we have now actually tend to confirm Kincaid and Powell's idea or is it clearly in contradiction with it? So let's look at the archaeological data. Oh, excuse me, there's just a little more here. Uh, uh, Powell said that uh, that Swan claimed that uh, that the, the macaws had only been there for about uh, 12 generations, but in fact, if you go back and read Swan, Swan doesn't say that macaws claim that they'd only been on the island for uh, on Cape Flattery for for 12 generations. They say that the oldest genealogy we know of uh, is only uh, 12 generations. And finally, and this is another important linguistic issue. Uh, Powell likes to cite Jacobson, another linguist, using uh, collateral chronology again in 1971, who argued that, this, that the temporal split between macaws and nitnats 
occurred about a thousand years ago. And he cites that in support of his claim that macaws have only been around for about a thousand years. But if one actually reads Jacobson 1971, it's very clear that Jacobson was not talking about the movement of people. Jacobson was talking about when the macaw language was discernible linguistically as a separate language from that now. And, and if that's what he's really talking about, then it begs a really important question. And again, I'm not a linguist, but I think one would have to question which is more likely. Would a group of people who just migrated out of their old territory to a new place decide to celebrate the fact of their new home by speaking a distinctly different language? Or is it more likely that their language began to drift in a different direction after they'd been isolated from their original group after some period of time? Personally, I think the latter is far more likely than the former. And while I don't have much confidence in the glottal chronological estimate of a thousand years, uh, just for argument's sake, if that number really is correct and macaw becomes as dis recognizable linguistically as a distinct language from Nitnat a thousand years ago, I would argue that that in itself is evidence that macaws have been separated a significantly longer period of time than a thousand years. Okay, let's look at some archaeological data now. And this is uh, the same map I showed you before with the distribution of sites. And uh, the dashed red line here is the approximate boundary between the, the two groups. And, and I will tell you that actually where the boundary between macaws and quileutes is or was at any particular point in time is a matter of some dispute. But a number of sources kind of plays it around the southern end of Lake Ozette. And you can see right here, first off, that there are far more excavated sites uh, in Macaw territory than there are in Quileu territory. And again, I'm not dealing with interior stuff. You can see that there are a few sites on this map uh, of shell middens that are somewhat interior. And these are older sites associated with older shoreline stand. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But these sites, in fact, were shoreline sites at the time that they were occupied. Um, it's some people might wonder why there are so many more excavated sites up here than they are down here. And some of this is because of the influence of the Ozette project, which stimulated work in a number of areas. Uh, Dale's original work at the Hoko site really was under the umbrella of the Ozette project. Ed Friedman tested sites up here in the 1970s. And the Ozette excavations here led to the development of a museum in Nia Bay, which I gather many of you have been to out of Macaw days. And the Macaw Cultural Research Center has actually supported a number of uh, test excavations that I've conducted elsewhere on the Macaw Reservation. Uh, the amount of work that's been done here in the Kulu territory has been much more limited. Um, some of this work was done by WSU many years ago, and most of the other sites around here have actually been limited studies uh, done by the National Park Service. But these are the sites that are actually in the, the this sample we're going to talk about. Okay, to give you just another sense of it, and again, a lot more sites in Macaw territory, not too many in Quileu territory. And I would point out a couple of things to you about this, just this table here real quickly. We have dates, approximate excavated volumes, artifacts, and this is chip stone, ground and uh, uh, peck stone, bone and antler artifacts. And then these columns here are quantified, actually identified faunal assemblages. And uh, if any of you are familiar with middens on the Northwest coast, you probably know that uh, these sites contain much higher densities of faunal remains than they do actual artifacts. Uh, point out a couple of other things to you also on this table. Um, and let me acknowledge that a couple of these numbers for the volumes are not right and have been corrected since then. But the general trend that you see here is, is, is really what I want you to look at. You can see that a couple of the sites like Ozet and the Hoka Wet Dry site have been excavated in relatively large volumes. Um, Toliak is a relatively large volume, although actually this number is wrong, should be around 300. 
Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of other sites where the volumes are really quite small, and these are test excavations. And in fact, most of the samples from Kalia are test excavations, um, and many of the Macaw ones are. Uh, and the two that are highlighted are wet sites that have large quantities of preserved organics that I'm sure Dale has told you about. And honestly, well, those preserved things are amazing at both sites and quite interesting. They're not real relevant to this analysis because we can't compare them to anyone else and there's no wet sites down here. What I do want you to note, a couple of things are, uh, again, many more larger faunal assemblages than artifacts. And when we look at chipped stone, and we look at the temporal ranges, we can see that sites in Macaw territory in the last 1500 years contain very little or no chipstone. And these older sites, sites that range between about 2000 to 4000 years in Macaw territory contain uh, much larger quantities of chipstone. So they're actually quite different from the more recent ones. And in the Quileute area, we have only sites within the last 1,000, 1,100 years. And chipstone is rare, but it is present in these sites. OK, looking at all of this stuff, uh, it's possible, uh, and for our purposes, to divide the, the Macaw sites into two separate groups. And the box in red here is what we technically refer to as young macaw and that's all the sites that range within the last 1500 years that contain very little chipstone and a second group of sites that include hoko and 420 that dale was talking about and some other ones that contain significant quantities of chipstone and these are for the purposes of this discussion we're going to call old macaw and all of the Quileute sites fall within the last 1100 years. And so the Quileute sites that we're talking about here and the young Macaw sites are essentially contemporaneous. And the old Macaw sites have no analog in Quileute territory. Okay, um, let's look at just real briefly what these assemblages contain. Young macaw assemblages, and again, we're not talking about the basketry and quarters now, are, are dominated by uh, bone tool forms of various types, various types of bone points, uh, composite toggling harpoon valves, unilaterally barbed things, wedges uh, are all quite common in these deposits. And so far, they're pretty close to indistinguishable between young macaw and quileu. Uh, there's very little chipstone in these sites, but we have ground and peckstone objects. We have wine weights with peck grooves on them, and we have various types of whetstones. And, and again, uh, nobody's been really been able to get very far to suggesting uh, consistent differences between young macaw assemblages and quileute assemblages. And as I've shown you already, there's not large numbers of these things in any of these sites. The all macaw assemblages, and Certainly, uh, Hoko falls in that group, contains some chip bifacial tools. And, and these assemblages are heavily dominated by bipolar flakes of uh, vein quartz, uh, tiny amounts of, of quartz crystal, but overwhelmingly they're vein quartz. And like Dale has at Hoko, these things are hafted in wooden handles, and replicative studies have suggested that these tools are very efficient for, for flank fish which I might add is not proof that that's what they were actually used for. But I think that that's a good suggestion to entertain what these things actually are. Uh, let me emphasize also, if some of you are familiar with hearing about microblades on the Southern Northwest coast, these are not microblades. Uh, microblades are a different technological tradition. These are small bipolar pieces where a vein quartz pebble is put on a stone anvil and then crushed. Uh, it's a technique that does tend to give some fragments that are straight, but this is different from microblade technology, and it's important not to confuse the two. Okay, so basically, what do we have here? I would tell you that the uh, young macaw assemblages, the Lake Creek contact macaw, are essentially equivalent to what Reagan called his old assemblages in macaw territory. The Quileute assemblages uh, that are are late 
free contact are essentially equivalent to Reagan's old inquiry territory. And for the, the, the question that we wanted to address, uh, the practical question really becomes, well then, who do the old Macaw assemblages actually represent? And is it possible to attribute them to one group or the other? Okay, in order to do that, uh, we need to be able to come up with some credible uh, way to actually recognize ethnographic groups in the archaeological record. And I think uh, it's fair to say that this is a, a difficult thing to do under most cases. And there are a few existing ideas about this subject. When we started our work, uh, Reagan, as they said, pointed out, had some ideas about it. Don Mitchell in 1990 had some ideas about it, and Dale most recently looking at basketry, and more recently, even from this talk in Cordage, had some ideas about it. So let's take a quick look at those. Reagan basically in his discussion um, told us two things in support of his claim that the Quileute assemblage underlied the Macaw assemblages in Macaw territory. And first off, he said that uh, Quileutes didn't make or use stone tools. And he argued that uh, the, the old, the very old stuff in Macaw territory underlying the old Macaw deposits, or what he called old, what I'm calling young Macaw, lacked stone tools. Now, first off, um, elsewhere in the same report, he describes stone tools from Quileute sites. So the, the claim is not even consistent within his own report in 1917. And as I've already shown you uh, in the table, uh, I showed you several images ago, while there are not large numbers of stone tools, very little chipstone, uh, in fact, ground and pack tools and a little bit of chipstone has been recovered from Quileute sites. So this contention that Quileute didn't make or use stone tools must be rejected. It's simply not accurate. And further, uh, we now know on the basis of, of Dale's work at Hokel and my work with the older sites on the, in the Cape Flatter area, that the older sites in Macaw territory that are distinctly different from the young Macaw sites, in fact, have a lot more chipstone in them. They don't have less, they have considerably more. So neither of Reagan's observations about the cultural chronology from the Cape Flattery area are supported either by his own work in 1917 or more recent work in the area. Okay, in about 1970 or so, uh, actually more recently than that, well, Don Mitchell was a Canadian archeologist who in the 1970s proposed uh, a, an approach to describing archeological assemblages uh, that was similar to the American use of the term phase. And he called them cultural ty culture types. And there are some theoretical differences between culture types and phases that don't really concern us here. Uh, but basically they're descriptions of assemblages that, that reoccur within a geographic area and a point in time. And in a paper he wrote in 1990, because he originally proposed this for the Northern Puget Sound Gulf of Georgia region, uh, he expanded it out. And one of the expanded types that he proposed in 1990 was what he called the West Coast culture type. And the area that he identified for the West Coast culture type is basically shown by this line here. And it's all the New Channel Waukesha speaking people on the West Coast of Vancouver Island and the Macaw. And, uh, and it's important to note that at the time he did this, there were really only two places on the West Coast of Vancouver Island where there were excavated collections, uh, Nootka Sound, Yukwat, and Heshkwia. And so he didn't have a lot of data from the west coast of Vancouver Island, but he proposed an assemblage that included a variety of bone points, uh, uh, unilaterally barb points, the uh, bi points, unit points, um, harpoon valves. Uh, there is some ground stone here. This is a wedge. These are fit ground stone fish up shanks, um, oh. worked whale bone, but very, very similar. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, Mitchell included macaw stuff from Ozette in his West Coast culture type. And, and I would certainly agree that the macaw stuff looks very much like that. Unfortunately, 
uh, we know a little bit more about quileate assemblages now than Mitchell knew in 1990. And as I've already told you, the, the quileate assemblages from the last thousand years fit very, very nicely within the West Coast culture type as well. Mitchell uh, argued that the West Coast culture type existed for more than 4,000 years on the West Coast of Vancouver Island with very, very little change in the assemblages. And he didn't include, uh, and, and at that time could not have known that the Quileute stuff a little further south is really indistinguishable for, uh, you know, fits very nicely in the West Coast culture type. So, well, this is an interesting idea. It doesn't really help us separate macaw from Quileute assemblages. Uh, I would tell you since Mitchell's work, considerably more work has been done on the West Coast of Vancouver Island, particularly in the Barkley Sound area. A number of sites are now available here. And it's clear that um, Mitchell's ideas about the West Coast culture type, I wouldn't say that they're wrong, but they're kind of simplistic. And we now know that material culture assemblages on the West Coast of Vancouver Island are more complex than uh, Mitchell uh, understood and are not nearly as stable in time over the last 4,000 years. So the picture is, is really more complex here. Okay, and then Dale, uh, working with Hotz at Basketry, and Dale showed you some of this just before he started, uh, looking at wet sites and basketry technology has, has argued for a very, very close relationship between Hoko at about 3,000 years and Ozet at three to 500 years. Uh, and and I, I find that work to be very convincing. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have any wet sites on the west coast of Vancouver Island, but I'm confident that we would see similarities when we find some there. Uh, more lacking for the purposes of this analysis is we don't really have any data of, on quileate, prehistoric quileate basketry. And so it would be really nice to find a wet site in this area. So that's that's really about as far as the, the ethnographic uh, the abilities or suggested ideas for identifying ethnic groups on the Northwest coast, or at least on the, in, on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula existed until quite recently. And I was looking, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. And uh, like I say, in about 2017, 2018, I really tried to kind of make some more sense out of it. And so I'd like to present a few other ideas about potential ways to kind of identify ethnographic groups in the archaeological record in this region. And uh, one of the first things I want I thought about a bit is these bipolar microliths from Hoko. Now, at uh, these these chipstone uh, bipolar quartz, uh, both the debitage and the microliths, occur at Hoko in deposits directly associated with basketry that Dale has argued is that can be associated with Wakash and speakers. And so from my point of view, if these things are associated with basketry that is Wakash, and it's not unreasonable to at least entertain the idea that these things are associated with the same Wakash and speakers that the basketry is associated with. They come from the same deposits. And at the time that Dale was excavating at Hoko in the 1980s, when these things were first coming out of the ground, um, they had no analog anywhere else on the southern northwest coast. Hoko was really the only place in Washington or British Columbia where this particular bipolar quartz technology was, was represented. Uh, but that's changed since then. Uh, and in fact, today, there are eight sites on the southern northwest coast that have essentially the same technology. Uh, there's Hoko over here. There's five other sites in the Cape Flattery area. And these are the old Macaw sites that I showed you in the table. Uh, and, and all five of these locations and these are all dry shells associated with an older shoreline. There's no basketry here, but the same chipstone technology is here. And these sites are all radiocarbonated between uh, about 2,500 years and about and almost 4,000 years. So they're all slightly older than Hoko. 
Additionally, two sites uh, excavated in the last 15 to 20 years in Barclay Sound have also been shown to contain this same chipstone technology. Uh, and again, these are currently the only eight places on the Northwest coast where this particular stone technology occurs. Uh, and these sites here are actually slight, well, the dating is a little fuzzy uh, on at least one of them at Seisha, but these sites are either contemporaneous with these or just slightly older. Uh, and so this to me is, is, is very interesting uh, and is certainly consistent with the notion that, that, that this technology is associated with Wakashans. Uh, at the same time, you know, you got to think about this a little, uh, just what this actually represents, because clearly Wakashans, and there are more sites that have been excavated up the west coast of Vancouver Island, where this technology does not occur. So I wouldn't argue that it's, a, it's a, an ethnic signature, if you will, of all Wakashans, but some subset of Wakashans. Uh, additionally, uh, if we accept the premise that these things are associated with butchering fish, which again, I say, I think is a reasonable idea. Uh, we have to say note that uh, older archeological assemblages from Vancouver Island and elsewhere on the coast show different fish butchering technologies and more recent ones show different fish butchering technologies. Uh, down here on the Olympic Peninsula, I think a lot of the fish butchering later get shifted over to using ground mussel shell knives, uh, which we see up here on the island as well. So it seems like we're talking about some, some set of Wakashian speakers who develop this bipolar quartz reduction technology for producing fish uh, uh, butchering knives. It comes into fashion for a while and then fades out of fashion and, and people move on to some other technology because certainly fish were being butchered both before and after the time that this occurs. But to me, the presence in Olmaca sites of this technology certainly argues to me a relationship to the North, not to the South. Having said that, and looked at that, we began to look at faunal assemblages. And I've always been interested in the faunal assemblages. And as I told you earlier, they're, they're much better represented in these sites than the artifact samples are. So let's just think about the faunal assemblages a little bit here. And first off, uh, before we look at the archaeological stuff, uh, I, I showed you this graphic earlier. This is from Rajaram Singh's uh, doctoral dissertation in the 1950s on, on the economies of people on the Olympic Peninsula. And he didn't work from archeological data. He worked from uh, both the available ethnographic documents on the Olympic Peninsula. And he also interviewed traditional elders in, at Macaw and Quileuho and actually further south in Quinault. Uh, that's not really relevant to us at the moment. But I wanted to take a, a look at a table that he generated in his dissertation. And, and this is uh, his uh, importance of food resources for each group. And he's ranked them. He's got the top 11 resources uh, and, and their relative importance for macaws and quileutes. And, and, and let me say at the outset, some of the rankings in this table are inconsistent with what we know from archeological assemblages now. Uh, for example, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that whales were the most, most important resource for macaws uh, and the third most important resource for quileutes. And similarly, uh, fur seals are ranked six and seven here. And, and we know now that fur seals were actually much more important in late prehistoric times. And there's some interesting reasons on what the fur seal story is. But just what I wanted to point out overall here, and I've color coded the numbers on this table also, uh, numbers in blue are marine resources. Uh, numbers in the, this kind of yellow brown are anadromous fish resources. And anadromous fish can be taken in the rivers. And uh, macaws at least were taking anadromous fish in salt water as well. And resources in uh, marked with green are terrestrial resources. And if you just look at the two 
sets of numbers, you could see that macaws uh, have uh, one, two, three, four, that the top five out of the top, well, all six of so the top six are, are all marine resources. Uh, the quileutes have a much smaller number of re marine resources and include ranks seven, eight, nine, and 10, even partly 11 here. So marine resources appear to be much less important to quileutes in, in this table. Uh, terrestrial resources like deer and elk are number 10 for macaws and number two for quileutes. And a number of ethnographic documents speak a lot to quileute hunting of deer and elk. Um, and you can also see that anadromous fish resources are, are significantly more important to quileutes. And again, they have the big rivers, and macaws don't. So this ethnographic uh, account argues in our mind, Steve and I, that there ought to be differences in the faunal assemblages between macaws and quileutes. Having said that, I have to tell you and acknowledge that, that there are some significant difficulties in actually trying to make these comparisons. I've already told you that some sites have very, very large samples. Other sites have much smaller size samples, just given the volumes that they've uh, represented. And it's also fair to say that some of these sites have different functions than others. Some are seasonal uh, camps associated with just certain resources. Others are multi-season camps. And there is just, if we're talking about even the coastal stuff, there's some environmental variability between the Cape Flatter area and further south. Uh, and those are all issues that, that we're struggling to kind of deal with and, and are another reason why, you know, these are just interesting ideas. But anyway, let's look at some numbers that we actually have for these. And, and first off, I have to tell you that for all of these numbers, and I'm going to show you in a number of other tables here shortly, uh, the, we quantify bones by density per cubic volume to kind of level out the differences between really large volume samples and small volume samples. And additionally, the counts per meter that we're talking about are the counts of identified bones, bones that could be identified to, to at least family level of taxa. So small bone fragments that are not identifiable beyond the level of saying, well, this is a fish or this is a bird, but we don't know what it is, are not actually included in these numbers. These are just identified animals. And, uh, and so the actual density numbers for total bone would actually be significantly higher. And, you know, even the amount of identified bone is going to vary with how fragmented the material is and how skilled the, the faunal analyst is and how good their faunal is, uh, comparative collection is. So those are all things that need to be factored in. But if we look at identified bone density just for the macaw sites compared to the quileute sites, we see that the density of bone overall is nearly twice as high as actually it is uh, a little bit more than twice as high in macaw sites. And you might recall that I told you earlier that the ethnographic that tells us that, uh, that the smaller number of macaw sites had much higher population levels. So, so this makes sense to us that we would see higher bone densities in macaw sites and quileute sites. If we look at the breakdown, which is represented here, but the pie charts, it's a little clearer of just what is the, the percentage of fish to mammals to birds in the two sites, we see that the two groups of middens have almost the same frequency or, or, or density of, uh, of fish bones in the total vertebrate assemblage. Uh, the mammal bone and bird densities vary a little bit more, showing significantly more birds in macaw sites and quileute sites. But the overall density is, is really significantly different on average between the two. Then uh, we have begun to look at a number of characteristics about uh, the, uh, the individual taxa in these ones. And I just wanna show you a couple of things here. And again, as I told you, this is at an early level of our analysis. We've, we've actually gone significantly further than that. But I wanna show you some numbers from fish and then from mammals and then from birds in terms of two different types of, 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 of examinations. And one of them are ubiquity values. And by ubiquity, we mean 
uh, and how many of the sites within that group does the animal actually occur? We're not actually looking at the density of it, just how, f how often do we see that animal in macaw sites as opposed to in quileute sites? And then we're actually gonna look at some individual fish density values here. So we look at ubiquity first, and again, by far fish are the most common type of animals represented in these in terms of vertebrate remains. You can see here that I've got uh, species that are 100%, 71%, 57%. We're just looking at things that are more than 50% ubiquity. Obviously, 100% ubiquity means this taxa occurs in every site in the sample. Uh, and 50% ubiquity means it only occurs in half of them. Um, and additionally here, uh, in terms of just the highlighting and stuff like that, uh, Pacific halibut and Pacific cod are highlighted separately because these fish occur further offshore. You gotta go out in deeper water to get them. And then the things that are in bold, but still black are larger body size fish, the, the rockfish, greenling, flatfish, cabazon, herring, are, these are smaller fish. And, and just looking at the numbers then, you can see that first off, more species of fish uh, occur in 100% of macaw sites than quileute sites and are particularly dominated by larger species. In fact, uh, there are more large species in uh, macaw sites than quileute sites. Quileute sites tend to have a, a broader range of smaller fish. And uh, another thing to point out, I've got an asterisk here. All of this recovery has been done with quarter inch mesh. Uh, and quarter inch mesh is gonna bias against small fish bone recovery. Uh, so 57, slightly more than half of the macaw sites have actually reported Pacific herring, a very, very small fish vertebra in with quarter inch mesh. And I can tell you, and we're not even really gonna talk about the densities of herring in these sites, because we know from volumetric studies that we only get a very small amount of these fish recovered in quarter inch mesh. But if we take volumetric samples of the matrix that the herring are in, and then dry them out and screen them through very, very fine screen mesh, uh, we see densities of 80 to 100,000 herring bones per cubic meter. So, so we know the fish is present, but it is massively underrepresented in these, uh, in these things. But I think you can see here already that uh, just the ubiquity of fish, the things that are in all macaw sites is really rather different from what we see in Quileute sites uh, and fish like uh, Pacific halibut and Pacific cod uh, simply do not occur in macaw sites. And these are the deep water fish. Additionally, and I don't know if this is in your way here, so I'll move it over. If we look at individual fish density values, and these again are preliminary numbers, basically what we've done here is we've looked at the average density and by the way, UK means unknown. So we don't know which kind of salmon or which kind of halibut. There's probably more than one species here. But these are the average densities for, in, from macaw sites and quileute sites. And then the number on the bottom, the difference is how many times greater uh, one is than the other. And if the number is in red, that means that the macaw is, is the greater here. So for example, in salmon, uh, the, the density of salmon and macaw sites is 7.8 times greater than it is in quileute sites. And this is a number we generated to look at these things. And because this is provisional and kind of exploratory, Steve and I were kind of debating on, well, how do we interpret these numbers? And I can tell you as a rule of thumb now, uh, we've kind of taken the position that a difference of of up to five times greater is probably not very significant uh, given all the other variables mixed up in this exercise. But uh, when we see differences of between five and 10 times greater, we're getting into ranges where we think that might be interesting. And when we see differences that are substantially greater than 10 times greater, we think we're really looking at something potentially important. And just looking at the fish identified here, You'll notice that, for example, greenling, rockfish, ling cod, they're, they're actually pretty similar in terms of the densities. 
Salmon is 7.8. That's getting up into a range where it might be uh, of some interest. And again, we suspect that what we may be seeing here is that macaws are taking salmon in salt water uh, rather than out of rivers. They don't have big rivers in their territory. Uh, but when we look at some of the others, for example, the halibut density in macaw sites is 22 times greater. Uh, the dogfish shark is almost 36 times greater in macaw sites than it is in, in, uh, in quileute sites. That, that, this is just a profoundly large difference. Uh, in fact, this is the largest single difference we see in any of our comparisons. And even in more recent uh, runs of this stuff, the, the predominance of dogfish and macaw sites over quileute sites is just absolutely stunning. Uh, and I can also tell you, not represented here, we've also more recently been looking at correlation matrices of which fish species co-occur together. And dogfish and halibut constantly co-occur together. When one is high, the other is high. They're not high on all macaw sites, but when, they're, when one is very high, the other is very, very high. And so those fish species are linked together in ways that simply have no analog in macaw site, in, in quileute sites. This is, a, this is a strong difference here. Okay, let's look at mammals now for a moment. Uh, and you see in mammal bone ubiquities, first off, uh, there are no mammal species in these sites that are in 100% of all quileute sites. And it's not even that big a quileute sample. We're talking about five sites now. Northern fur seal and sea otter are present in all of them, or in three quarters of them, but not in all of them. Whereas northern fur seal, hair seal, and deer are present in, uh, in all of them. And you'll see elk are present in 88% of them. And elk, doesn't, elk occurs in less than 50%. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was really striking to us, and it's not really represented in this table here. The total mammal bone assemblage that we're looking at for quileute sites is about 4,000 bones. And among those 4,000 bones, we have one elk bone, one. <laughs> uh, you can also see that we see, have a much wider diversity of mammals in these bones. When we look at the density values again, uh, in most cases, they're not very different here. The quileutes are slightly higher, 1.7, 2.7 for sea lion, hair seal. Uh, we don't have a lot of porpoise and macaw sites, but we don't have any in quileute sites. And look at this. Uh, quileutes are described ethnographically as the big deer and elk hunters, but in fact, the density of of deer and elk bones in macaw sites is seven and a half times greater than it is in quileute sites. Um, we, when we first saw that, we thought, well, something's wrong here. That's not right. But really, we're, we're increasingly confident that it is right. And what this is telling us, we think, is that quileutes, and I've told you, the majority of that population is really based in these interior river valley villages. And they just come out to the beach in the spring and the summer. And, and I think what this number really means is that when quileutes come out to the ocean, they don't bother hunting deer and elk out there. They got much better places to hunt those animals up the valley in the interior. Macaws, on the other hand, don't have better places up in the interior valley to hunt these animals. So they hunt them at the beach because that's where they spend their time. And I think really that's what we're seeing here. Um, and so we think even though this is not quite 10, this is a really interesting and, and significant number here. Um, okay, looking at birds, and you might recall from what I showed you before in that first big table, birds are not really very common in these assemblages. Uh, they're 70% mammal, you know, another 20 odd percent. Uh, excuse me, 70% fish, another 20%, 25% mammal. Birds are really a small group, and they're also a very, very diverse group. We have probably 80 different species of birds represented in this thing, although most of them in small numbers. But here again, we see, and what I've highlighted here, the red ones are offshore deep water birds. 
we have a number of species uh, or groups of birds that occur in all macaw sites. Uh, we don't have any variety of bird that occurs in all Quileute sites, and, and, and it's a much lower, much less intensive use of birds. Uh, and you can see 75%, 50%, a much wider range of birds represented in macaw sites. Uh, and when we look at densities again, we're at 8.2 for offshore birds, and those are the things represented red, shearwaters, albatross, northern fulmars, are birds that you really have to go out into deep water to get. Uh, fulmars are represented in 75, albatross is only in half of them, and we don't even see shearwaters in this group. We see uh, interesting high numbers for loons and grebes, uh, for diving ducks and dabbling ducks. Um, raptors are present in only macaw sites, but that's really small numbers and that could be sample size related. We, we think that this number is a reflection of macaws just being out in deep water more regularly than quileutes. And the diving duck number here is actually heavily um, weighted by scoters, uh, white wing scoters, uh, surf scoters. Uh, for uh, those of you who may not be familiar with scoters, scoters are basically a kind of a saltwater goose. And scoters are a seasonal bird. Uh, they're not really present on the coast in the summertime. They're more present in the winter, or late fall, early spring. And then they go someplace else. They think they go further north in the summertime. And we suspect that this difference reflects the fact that there aren't a lot of quileutes on the coast in the late fall, winter, and spring. They, much of that population has moved back into the interior at that time of year. And so it's a bird that they're just not picking up because they're not on the coast at that time. Um, okay, so what do we have here in terms of looking at funnel assemblages that potentially might tell us the difference? And again, we're just calling these possible candidates now. I've told you that uh, five of the macaw sites have herring in them. Uh, I didn't really show you in there because there's only one site, so it's really low ubiquity. Only one of the Quileute sites has large numbers of small fish bones in it. And again, densities between 80 and 100,000. And that fish has been identified not as herring, but as surf smelt. And uh, you, if you were looking at Singh's table when I showed it to you earlier, uh, Singh reports surf smelt as a, as a fish that is important to quileutes. It's not important to macaws. We've been talking to macaw fisheries, and it sounds like smelt might be more, more available in the quileute territory than in macaw territory. So that may account for what it is, but we're not 100% clear on that. Uh, additionally, porpoises, pelicans, crows, and ravens, and raptors, in, in this data, only occur in macaw assemblages. In these cases, it may be a sample size issue because these things occur in rel only relatively small numbers, but they're at least candidates for being possible differences. Uh, we also would argue that uh, assemblages, uh, they contain more than approximately five to 10% of Pacific halibut, of dogfish shark, of Pacific cod, of deer, and elk, and offshore birds are likely to be macaw assemblages rather than quileute assemblages. Uh, and actually, let me get this out of here on the bottom. Uh, and then two other things that we also noted is if the, t if the overall total bone density of all vertebrate bones, fish, mammal, and birds, is less than 500 per cubic meter, it's more likely to be, uh, it's greater than, uh, than uh, excuse me, uh, 500 meter, then it's and it's more likely to be a macaw, and if it's less than 500, it's more likely to be quileute. And additionally, we would argue that if the fish taxa are dominated by large body size fish, it's more likely to be a macaw, and if it's dominated by small species, it's more likely to be quileute. Um, I would emphasize here that we don't assert that these are established facts, but these are clear trends in the data. And so just as a interesting exercise here, let me just uh, walk through here, but let me share something else with you on this, uh, on how this might be used. 
all of the comparisons that I have shown you so far and all of the numbers that I've shown you are based on comparing young macaw sites to the quileute sites, to samples that are contemporaneous with each other. None of those values that I have shown you reflect faunal assemblages from the old macaw sites. But certainly we are thinking that if we can convince ourselves that some of these criteria really make sense and are useful measures of whether it's macaw assemblage or quileute assemblage, we didn't like to use those characteristics and look at the old macaw sites and try to get some sense as to whether they look more like quileute sites or they will look more like macaw sites. And I've already told you that the, that the bipolar quartz that we see only in the old macaw sites certainly suggests ties to Vancouver Island. So what I wanna do here real quickly is the southernmost of all of the old macaw sites is 45 CA201. It's on the north side of Sandpoint here. It's the southernmost of the, um, most of the other old macaw sites are up here. And so this is the site closest to Quileute territory. And you may remember from that graphic I showed you earlier that the boundary for macaw Quileute is right about here around the south end of Lake Ozette. So just uh, for the purposes of discussion, Let's look at the final assemblage from 201 and see how it compares to the characteristics that I've just shown you. And so here's some final assemblage data for, for 45CA201. And first off, the overall total vertebrate bone density for 45CA201 is 1,752 identified bones per cubic meter. This is an extremely high. In fact, this is the highest bone density of any site in our sample, Quileute, Young Macaw, or Old Macaw. This, is, this, this deposit has mass quantities of, of uh, bone in it. And if we look at the fish bone assemblage, where we've got a density of 1,288 per cubic meter, 30% of this assemblage is Pacific halibut. Another 4% of it is dogfish shark. Uh, Pacific cod is not real abundant. It's only about 1% Pacific cod, but Pacific cod is 1% is of, you know, 1,200 bones here. Uh, if we look at uh, the mammal bone assemblage, and the mammal bone alone is, is almost at that 500 bone, uh, per cubic meter threshold, overwhelmingly fur seal, and, and frankly, all of these sites are overwhelmingly fur seal. The fur seal is probably 90% of the mammal in all of them. But we have both deer and elk represented in this site. In fact, there's more elk bones at CA201 than from all of the Quileute sites together. And then when we look at uh, the bird assemblage, and again, much, much lower densities, but 42% of all of the birds at 45 CA201 are offshore birds, halibut, fulmer, shearwaters. Uh, large quantities of diving ducks and dabbling ducks. We got uh, the, the scoters represented here. So, well, again, we wouldn't say that this is proof that 45 CA201 represents Wakash and uh, it's a macaw site. This, the, the faunal signature that we see at this site shows many of the characteristics that are, that we believe uh, are suggestive of, of macaw economies rather than quileute economies. Okay, just a few things. All right, so what does this all mean? And I would say, first off, we don't see any evidence of a, uh, in macaw territory that suggests a prior presence of, of quileutes in this area. Uh, a number of the, the earlier non-archeological linguistic arguments we believe are flawed. And we would argue that the current archeological evidence suggests doesn't prove, doesn't demonstrate, but suggests that all macaw assemblages are related to those on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And so, and so what does this tell us about timing? Uh, the ideas up in Canada for the origins of, of Wakashians, and this is linguistically based, uh, but the linguists have argued that the Wakashian homeland is on the northern end of Vancouver Island. Uh, and that Wakashian spread southward over time down the west coast of Vancouver Island, and that the macaw presence on, on the tip of Cape Flattery is the end of that movement south. And, and I think that there's a fair amount of, 
of acceptance of that in British Columbia, although I would know that there's been almost no archaeology up here on the northwest or uh, the northern end of Vancouver Island in the so-called Wakashan homeland or suggested Wakashan homeland that actually demonstrates that Wakashan uh, related assemblages are older here than anywhere else. That's something that really needs to be done. Okay, um, ling there's two different linguistic dates for the Wakashan dispersal. Squash, who was the guy who originally developed Guado chronology, published a paper in 1954 in which he argued that the split of Wakashans, because we get Wakashans moving north also, that the split, and so the the New Chano people and Macaws and Tititat are the southern group. Uh, Swanish argued in 1954 that that movement, that split occurred about 2,900 years ago. Now, clearly, if that estimate is accurate, then, then what I'm calling all Macaw sites on, on the Cape Flatter area can't be Wakashans because we've got these assemblages dating back to about 4,000 years on, on the Cape Flattery area. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Sheila Embleton, and what I believe is one of the most recent actually efforts to use uh, glottochronology on the Northwest coast, um, and that was in 1985, produced a revised form of glottochronology, and she estimated that the split actually happened about 5,500 years ago. And for our purposes and our at least view of these issues, well, a 2900 date is completely incompatible and a, and a fatal flaw for our notions of older Macaw or older Wakashan presence. Uh, a 5500 year date makes lots of sense. That, that fits our notions very nicely. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't really understand the refinements in Embleton's a lot of chronological efforts, and I personally don't have very much confidence in either of these estimates, <laughs> to be frank. Uh, but uh, certainly, the Scottish's older estimates really are, are, mean our ideas can't be right, and Emilton's ideas are, are not at all inconsistent with our ideas. Okay, so I might, might point out just real quickly uh, Canadian archaeologists have some different ideas about what this spread of Wakashans down the coast was all about. And certainly they visualize it in a part as an invasion or a movement of actual people. But there are also ideas about just the fusion of ideas and technology. Uh, Al McMillan has called this cultural fusion sometime and has suggested that there's oral history from the Barclay Sound area of, of, of in fact, Salishan groups in the Port Alberni area adopting these technologies and, and wind up in fact speaking Wakashan languages over time. Um, some people have suggested that in fact a similar thing was happening on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and then in fact, uh, the Quileutes absorbed these Wakashan ideas from Wakashans after they arrived in the Cape Flattery area. And that's why late, uh, New Macaw and the Quileute assemblages from the last thousand years look so much the same. And in fact, Quileute uh, Chamaquian speakers absorbed these technologies, uh, although did not pursue them as intensively as uh, as the Wakashans, as the Wakashian neighbors did, because they uh, they had good access to better interior areas. I personally think that that's a rather interesting idea. And so, for the Olympic Peninsula, just by way of wrapping up. Uh, I don't see any credible evidence for macaws having arrived as recently as a thousand years ago, nor do I see any credible evidence to suggest that Quileus were actually on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula. Uh, well, let me say as a caveat to that, that, that the Quileute assemblages are so limited so far that it's really hard to say, suggest, I mean, I've offered some ideas here about how we might recognize what Cashins in the archaeological record um, that need to be tested further with better data. I really can't suggest anything about how we might recognize quileutes in the archaeological record. So I'm not saying they were never there. I'm just saying I don't see any evidence of them that, that can be perceived now. I personally think that Macaws and Wakashans crossed from 
what, what Macaws slash Wakashians, and I'll return to that in a moment. The Wakashians came from the west coast of Vancouver Island to the northwest of the Olympic Peninsula by or even slightly before 4,000 years ago, much, much older than 1,000 years ago. Uh, and that pre contact quilly of maritime activities may have been learned from Wakashians, just as I said. In fact, Frachtenberg suggested exactly that in 1921, Andrade suggested it in 1931, and Pettit, who did an ethnography of the Quileutes in the 1950s, records Quileutes saying specifically that themselves. Quileutes told Pettit that they learned how to hunt fur seals from people at Ozak, that they learned how to hunt whales from macaws. Uh, and, and I think that that's very likely the kind of cultural diffusion of ideas that Macmillan and others have reported for the Barclay Sound area on Vancouver Island. Okay, and, and as a final thought here, I would offer a few predictions based on this stuff. I'll stick my neck out here a little bit. I think that more sites with bipolar quartz microlithic materials uh, dating between two and 4,000 years will be found on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the future. I don't think large numbers of them will, but I think that some more will, possibly in the Barclay Sound area or elsewhere on the southwestern part of Vancouver Island. And I don't think that they'll be found anywhere else in British Columbia, and they're not known anywhere else in British Columbia at this time. Similarly, I think more sites containing the same bipolar quartz mic microlithic material will be found on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula, largely confined to the area that macaws occupied today. And they will not be found anywhere else in Washington and they're not known anywhere else in Washington. And specifically, I don't think we'll see them in Quileute territory as Quileute territory is understood better. I think that as we get more faunal assemblages, uh, that the kinds of ethnographic, uh, ethnic distinctions that we're seeing that I've suggested in the final record here will become clearer and more established. Uh, I think that, that specifically that type of difference makes sense. I do think that when, when there's more work from the Quileu part of the coast that we will see that Quileu people were in fact exploiting marine resources more than 1100 years ago, the oldest states we have right now. But I think we will also find, as we get better data from the region, that uh, at any point in time, that the Quileute use of maritime and marine resources was less sophisticated and probably less intensive than what was occurring just to the north of them. And, and finally, as a last thought in this thing here, well, I've been talking about Quileute mittens. The truth is, is we're not really going to get good, a good understanding of the prehistoric economy of Quileute peoples until we actually have some fall data from Quileute sites up those river valleys, because we're really only looking at one portion of the Quileute economic posture in this analysis. And, and so it's to be hoped that we're going to find some. But I would also tell you somewhat pessimistically that in the absence of showman deposition, the areas up the, the Quileute Valley up around Forks and Not are dominated by soils that are acidic in nature. They're not really going to favor good bone preservation uh, unless we could, you know, people are actually going to be transporting shell up there, which I don't think is likely, although Albert Reagan claimed in 1917 that there were shell mittens on Forks Prairie. Nobody has seen them since, but, but he, he did say that they existed at that time. Okay, and then just some final comments just to emphasize here. Uh, I kind of, in my comments here, use the terms macaw and wakash and speaker somewhat interchangeably, and that's just a little bit sloppy on my part. As I indicated to you when we were history, uh, particularly the story about how the macaws get in Ea Bay and Tatouche. And there are other oral histories from both macaw territory and from southwestern Vancouver Island that tell of a time when Nitnat people were on the Cape Flattery and on the northwestern Olympic Peninsula. So for this distinctions, for example, at, at CA201 at 2000 years, where I showed you faunal assemblages that look very Wakashian, and I call that old macaw, 
I'm not saying that I know for certain that macaws were present there for 4,000 years, but certainly I think Wakashian speakers, people who came across from the west coast of Vancouver Island were present there. They may well have been macaws or their direct ancestors, or they may have been other Wakashians. Uh, I don't think we have the resolution for what we're talking about here to actually tell the difference between macaws and other Wakashians. Uh, what about Quileute people? Uh, it's really hard to say. I, I will accept the notion that Quileutes were probably on the Olympic Peninsula for a very long period of time, that they may well have been present before Wakashians arrived, uh, as Reagan suggested. Uh, but if that's the case, I don't think it was a thousand years ago. I think it was much older than that, and uh, it's hard to say. And as a last point on that subject, we have very little data from older sites on the Olympic Peninsula to suggest who might have been present more than 4,000 years ago, not just in the Northwestern tip. But I would point out to people that David Conka, who's currently the Olympic Park archeologist, uh, for his master's thesis, excavated a site uh, near the outflow point of Lake Ozette, very close to the, where the Cape of Lava Trail starts. And he excavated a site there that can uh, just as it's not a shellman, it's just a lithic assemblage, but it has all the earmarks of, uh, of an old cot or old Cordillerian assemblage. Uh, and uh, Roy Carlson in the 1990s suggested as an idea, which I think is a very interesting idea, that these uh, so called old cot, old Cordillerian, uh, pebble tool, you know, they go by a bunch of different names you know, throughout the Pacific Northwest, uh, both, both sides of the mountains. So Roy suggested that uh, he thought that those very early, early mid to middle Holocene assemblages, and, and the stuff at Lake Ozette is not dated, but is believed to be representative of that. He suggested that there that those are ancestral proto-Salishan. It's the term he used. Uh, he didn't argue that that's a demonstrated fact. I don't think it's demonstrated, but I think it's an interesting idea and a good idea. And, and if that's the case, then we still don't have any, any real archaeological visibility of Chamaquian speakers in this picture. Uh, and, and clearly more work needs to be done on that part of the peninsula. And uh, that's pretty much what I want to describe. I, I will tell you again, as I said before, Steve and I are working on further work with the same idea with the faunal assemblages. We have one more Macaw site and one more Quileute site faunal assemblages that we've gotten out of the Olympic Park just recently that we are in the process of working up now. So we hope to have somewhat larger sample sizes for both sets of uh, uh, portions of the coast. And we are working on more sophisticated statistical examinations of both of them. Uh, and, but preliminarily, the patterns that I have described to you and the candidates in terms of uh, dogfish and halibut and deer and elk seem to be holding up in these numbers that these are real differences between the middens in the two regions. And so I, th I think I'll leave it there. And if uh, people want to ask some questions, uh, if there's time for that, I'm certainly happy to try to address them. Yeah, so yeah, we do have time. Uh, and I, I just like to point out, I, I see what uh, Gary's been doing and uh, what I've been doing really comes out of the fact that we did Ozette and, <laughs> and continue to do work uh, because of the influence of uh, his faunal work there and my uh, mm -hmm. basketry work. But anyway, can we, uh, let's, any, any questions about the thoughts here? You can uh, speak right up, oh, there's your, take your mic off. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you saw, but Pat Pringle isn't here anymore, uh, oh. Gary, but he put us some uh, chats about Reagan oh. there, Albert Reagan. Oh, oh okay. Uh, take a look. So, uh, Dale, this is Bill Guy here. Yeah, I'd be at the very end here, but he's talking more about geology and... Uh, yeah, you know, Reagan was not, Reagan 
goes on after he's at La Push. He was at La Push from 1905 to 1909. Reagan actually got a PhD from Stanford University in 1925, and it was in geology. No. Uh, and some of the very first papers, uh, which I see that Pat has put here, is referred to Reagan's geology, recent changes in the elevation, 1929. Uh, Reagan wrote about that stuff. Uh, Reagan spent, after he got his PhD, he actually was a professor at, at uh, Brigham Young University in Utah uh, until the 1930s. And he actually taught anthropology and he did some excavations in the Southwest and uh, maybe even in Mexico, I'm not sure. Uh, as from what I understand and biographies that I read of him, um, he was really an avocational archaeologist. He, he never had any formal training in archaeology. He certainly didn't have any, and, and I think it's quite clear that the digging that he did uh, in Macaw and Quileute territory between 1905 and 1909, uh, assuming he really did dig, because I have no, I can find no evidence that he actually dug. And for that matter, I cannot find any evidence that he actually collected artifacts from the digs that he dug. Uh, I've tried to figure out where that stuff went, and I can't even show that there was stuff that re was recovered. But it was probably the first excavations he ever did. Uh, and so I think, well, the seven, 1970 paper has some real interesting ideas. We really need to kind of take those ideas with a grain of salt. We, we really don't know how he got his chronology. We don't know whether he found sites that actually had those different units stratified in the same place or whether he had one site over here that had old stuff and another site that had ancient site and he used some mechanism to kind of arrange them chronologically. None of that is explained in his writing. The questions about what you observed or thought? Yeah, Dale, this is Bill Guy. I have a, a question. Um, an observe uh, an observation and a question about the herring mm -hmm. or not herring the um, smelt. I have actually uh, netted in jig smelt at the mouth of the Ozette River, so I, I found that odd. I just wonder if there's a reason why there would be no smelt bones in any of the assemblages uh, north right around the mouth of the river, and also. Um, just north of the end of Vancouver Island, you have an island called Calvert Island, just on the other side of Queen Charlotte Sound. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, from what I understand, Dale, didn't they? We had a, a, a lecture about how they were using uh, ground penetrating radar, and they had found a site out there that was, uh, I forget how old, but uh, well over 10,000 years. Uh, I was just uh, wondering if uh, any of these sites down onto Vancouver and further south um, have any uh, correlation or relationship with that uh, site on the west coast of Calvert Island. Well, you know, I, I would tell you, first off, that the question of smelt and whether smelt, uh, the, whether the difference right now in, in this preliminary data between smelt at La Push and again, we don't see smelt in any of the other Quileute sites, but some of the other Quileute sites were some of the very earliest work done on the coast. The work at Toliak Point, and we're working with a Toliak sample now, it was done in 1959, and I, it's not even clear that they screened it that in those days. They were just kind of picking up stuff. But I've been talking to the Macaw Fisheries guys as to whether or not smelt are available within Macaw territory. And while they did not mention the mouth of the Oze River, and that's interesting to hear you report that, uh, Macaw Fisheries tells me that there are some reports of smelt at Shai Shai Beach, which is you know just a little bit south of Macaw Bay. Uh, and so it's not clear to us now that, this, that, that that distinction is simply a question of, well, smelt are available in Quileu territory but not in Macaw territory. Um, you know, the other thing I would tell you also, which I think we need to consider also, is, is that the Macaw samples that have been looked at uh, in these volumetric samples produced hundreds and hundreds of, of very small bones. 
many of which are really not in very good condition because of just the way the fish was processed in archaeological sites. And uh, well, only herring have been positively identified in them. I don't think we can say with 100% certainty that no smelt was present uh, because of the condition of the bone. But, but so far in terms of what has been identified, none of the macaw sites have actually identified smelt. And, and I think at Hoko, um, there's actually anchovy has been reported there in addition to herring, but I don't think there's any smelt reported at Hoko. In fact, I'm sure of it, there's no smelt reported at Hoko. So, uh, you know, um, it's something we're hoping to learn more about, but at the moment, from the ethnographic documents, certainly Singh and Pettit say that smelt at the mouth of, you know, on the beaches at La Push was an important resource and that people came down out of the interior valleys to get smelt in the summertime. Right, I think you might be thinking about Colin Greer's talk about ground powder training radar in the Gulf of Georgia area. Um, but we have talked about Calvert, Cot Palman uh, Island with Duncan McLaren. Mm -hmm. Colin, I don't know. You're the only talk I think that really went into ground penetrating radar with us. Is that what you might have meant, Guy? Colin is here, um, at least in. Uh, no, they found even footprints. Yeah, and, uh, Cotford Island. Yeah. And uh, and when they checked back with the uh, with the tribes that are that are still there, they of course said they've always been there, and I believe it was twelve or thirteen thousand years old is what they were saying yeah. at the time. Yeah, that that's uh, that's true. I did work up there with them, and and uh, Daryl Fedgey is mm -hmm. Duncan found uh, footprints. Yeah, there's, there's some early dates from here, but I don't think that there's any any reason to attribute those to Wakashians, and there's certainly nothing of that antiquity on the west coast of Vancouver Island. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I don't think they use ground penetrating radar in Calvert, as far as I can oh, recall. We had a talk by Colin about his amazing work on houses. Oh. <clears throat> well, thanks. Uh, okay. Any uh, any other observations? that you'd like to ask? What yeah, I could jump in with a question, uh, Dale. Good. Sure. Uh, so Gary, I mean, interesting stuff and I love the patterns here. I'm just kind of wondering about the older material. And of course you've mentioned the limits of the samples, but uh, it's interesting in terms of thinking about the, the Quileute area and that they've kind of splitting the economy between coastal and interior. So I think you're very much correct in that the sites you see in Quileute territory on the coast are kind of half the picture of what they're doing. Right. And so I'm wondering if in some ways compared to Macaw sites, we're gonna expect a lot less diversity in Quileute sites perhaps. Maybe the, just the number of different species of things represented there because it's half the economy relative to the, the Macaw sites potentially, that could be one expectation. So I'm wondering if some way, just the sheer diversity that you're seeing in Macaw sites is, you know, cause you're getting the whole economy and that's distinctive, but to actually mobilize that as a, a quantitative strategy, you'd need to really account for the different sample size because of course diversity is really dependent on the sample sizes you have. Right. So I, I guess the, the ultimate question then is, is, have you been exploring ways to kind of control for the, the fact that diversity is going to vary highly across those sample sizes? Well, we've been, you know, certainly like we're, we're quantifying things in terms of density rather than frequency. Um, Steve has been looking at, at in some of the correlation things he's doing uh, by ranking them rather than quantifying. Yeah. He's, he's, he's really struggling with that. I mean, to me, there's, there's issues about sample size. There's issues about site function. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of variables here. And, and to me, as I understand the Quileute ethnographic stuff, and again, there's not a whole lot of data on it, but, but the way it's described uh, in some of the documents and Swindell's uh, Indian Land Claims Commission stuff from the 1940s where he interviewed elders about resource use uh, has some really interesting stuff there. And 
and, and it suggests, and I mentioned before, that while the majority of the Quileutes seem to have been interior based, who came out to the coast in the in the spring and summer and seemed to be focused on just marine resources when they were there and then went back up into the interior as the fish moved into the rivers in the fall. Uh, it, there seems like there was a smaller part of the Quileute population that was actually coastally based and moved into the interior in the summertime to hunt deer and elk and then came back out to the coast. So one of the things we've been wondering about, although our Quileute samples are so small that we don't see them, is 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 are some Quileute sites the summer residences people who are winter based in the interior and are there other Quileute sites that are coastally based people who are actually out there during the winter time so so there's yet another dimension of possible variation there in the faunal assemblages by two really different kind of seasonal strategies within the Quileute community um, and and the and the truth is is the sample sizes are a lot smaller, which is why I keep emphasizing that uh, we're real interested in these ideas. But I think the most we can really produce out of this are a set of ideas for hypothesis testing as better samples become available. I certainly wouldn't at, at the end of this exercise say, "Aha, we've proven something about these moons." Uh, I think there there are some. Things that we're seeing there are consistent with our ethnographic expectation, you know, the expecta expectations that we would have. Because one of the things that I spent some time going on at the beginning is before we were really looking at the archaeological data, just kind of built a model of what does it sound like Quileutes would be doing and what does it sound like macaws. And to be honest, we knew more about the macaw data than we did about the Quileute data when we started. But said, well, we'd expect to see these, you know, how would that be manifested archaeologically? And and some of the issues like that, yeah, we'd expect to see much higher densities in macaw sites because the, there's the suggestion that just larger numbers of people were present at those places than than, than at the Quileute sites, aside from La Push. We know that La Push was a large, important center at the mouth of the river. But some of these other places probably, you know. I, I don't trust the, the, the physical dimensions of the size of these sites and the site records because they've all been eroding. Uh, but, you know, I'm kind of thinking that the, just the densities of material in them is some measure of the intensity of use of them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, in, in my mind, in Steve's mind, this is really kind of exploratory research. And let me emphasize something else here too. Well, we're trying to do this we're trying to find ways that we can make sense out of integrating these small samples with the big samples and, and apply them all. And, and we're doing that in the face of other archeologists in the past who have said flat out. I mean, when Randall Shark wrote the research design for the Olympic National Park in the 1980s, he just says flat out simple declarative sentence that all of those small volume tests are just too small to be useful. And, you know, and he just walks away from them. Uh, and my attitude is, is, well, they have significant flaws in them, but to say they are of no value is nonsense. And, and something else in my mind, beyond looking at the Olympic Peninsula, I think as we look at archaeology in the region today, and I think that this is more than just Western Washington, but if we look at archaeological work on the coast in Washington over the last 40 years, most of the big large volume exercises were done decades ago. <laughs> when the economy was different and the political climate was different. And I think we've seen a real trend toward more and more smaller excavations. And in a CRM context, which is where I spent most of my life working, we see more and more small volume excavations that are really test excavations to try to do determinations of availability in a CRM environment. They're not really research driven. And I think we're going to see more and more of that and less and less of the large scale data recovery excavations that were happening in the 60s, 70s and 80s. I, I think the COVID-19 situation is certainly going to make money tighter uh, at before. So I think it's really important, not just for the Olympic Peninsula, but for archaeologists working in this region and other places where the same thing is happening to find ways to make these small volume efforts more useful. 
beyond just determining whether or not this is a National Register eligible site. And these small volume efforts produce, at least in coastal shellmans, small quantities of actual artifacts and large samples of fossil materials. And so I think there's a real need to learn how to integrate and get useful information out of these smaller volume faunal assemblages, not just here on, on the Northwestern Olympic Peninsula, but more broadly. So we're messing around. Uh, Steve Samuels, honestly, is doing more of the statistical number crunching than I am. Uh, and Steve, even for the, a, no, a number of these correlation matrices that he's been generating lately, has been, you know, he and I have been going back and forth on how to structure the data, and he's been doing it three or four different ways to see, you know, what which way actually gives us more information. And and to my mind, I'm I'm not aware of too many other people who are really doing this kind of stuff. We've been looking around for analogs, and we don't see many other people really trying to do it. Well, the one suggestion I'd have is that if you want to make use of the small sample sizes, if you could pool the whole collection together and then figure out what the expected diversity of a site is for any given sample size, and you can do that with certain simulation routines, then you could make use and say, hey, wow, it wouldn't be interesting if all the, the Quileute sites are less diverse than you'd expect when they're right. relative to the whole sample, and all the Macaw ones are much more diverse. And in some way, you could make an expectation for that at any given sample size. But we're getting down in the weeds here a little bit. Sorry yeah, to everyone else, you know, but, just, uh, no, I, I think that's important. But one of the things, and honestly, Steve and I have big arguments about this stuff. And and because one of the things I'm saying, well, we're lumping all of the Macaw sites sorry. together and all of the Quileute sites together. And we know ethnographically that some of them are big multi-season villages and some of them are seasonal camps. And so I keep telling Steve, well, we need to just look at the big villages and, and we need to just look at the seasonal camps and the truth of the matter is that just reduces our sample size when we do that. So, I mean, there's a bunch of trade-offs here. There, there really are. Um, well, it's good work. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about um, artifacts as, as ethnic identity, whether it's basketries or bipolar. And I, I, I would like to ask, we have a, a member of a long line of uh, macaw basket weavers from uh, the Peterson family, uh, Helen Peterson and on down, Stephanie. Stephanie, uh, just if, if we can get you to comment on what you think, if there's a difference between Quileute basketry and macaw that's identifiable or here. Thank you, Dale. Um, so differences in macaw basketry versus Quileute basketry. Yep. So in my family, we've talked about this quite a bit um, as a lot of the basketry that's portrayed present day with a lot of similarities, a lot of the wrapped twine, similar designs. Um, and there's a strong feeling that the usage of that style and those designs is a relatively um, new occurrence for those for uh, Quileute and Quinault and and Ho, um, and that the usage of that style is more predominantly associated with macaws looking at historic sites. Um, and that's when you also, one of the things that's been shared with me um, is the type of materials mm -hmm. that, are, that are being used. Um, and you can see that evident in, um, you know, as, as within basketry, how there is the new development nowadays where people use uh, sinew and, and previous to that, there was the introduction of raffia. And um, uh, you can actually look at individual families and see some of the materials that they use and know that it comes from a certain family um, just by looking at the basket because their family tends to have that trait of using certain 
certain types of grass. They're, they were more skilled at making certain types of baskets. Um, I even know a person present day that they learned to use a certain grass that they learned from their family that's over in Lummi. And so it's a grass that they incorporate into their weaving at macaw, but it's not a grass that macaws have historically used. Mm. And so um, the evolution, I guess you can say, of the um, basket weaving and the differences between the tribes, you can also see the differences between the families, but it's not just the differences in the designs, but also the materials that are being used. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's kind of like when Gary's talking about stories, just like basketry, it almost comes to family stories uh, that are owned. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, the traditions of family is really uh, guarded in the basketry and I think it's a thing of material too. I, I've seen some differences between macaw old baskets and Willie, particularly like vine maple, split vine maple used to make their storage baskets. And we'd find mm -hmm. those at Ozette, but they're very rare. So I think they're coming in from Quilly, you'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Dale, part of the story here is we just need more work done in the Quilly part of the coast. They just. <laughs> not been anywhere near as much work as there's been done up in Macaw territory. So, you know, uh, it'd be really nice to find a wet site, you, you, three, you know, 3,000 year old wet site somewhere in, in Quilio territory where we could really look at old basketry. Uh, or, you know, I mean, it's like I pointed out in a thing here, there are no sites that have been sampled in Quilio territory that are contemporaneous with the what I call the old macaw sites that are in the Cape Flatter area. We just we just have no knowledge of what was going on uh, on the coast in that time frame. Hey, and Stephanie, I think you didn't come in when I did my introduction, uh, and, and I know you really appreciate Ed Carrier's work from Suquamish. He he's a artist in residence at um, Bloedel Reserve for the next couple of weeks, and loves visitors. So I'll send you his phone number uh, if you want to call him and try to visit him at some point on Bainbridge Island. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? That... I, I would just observe, Gary, <laughs> from what you're saying, I'm in I'm a kind of a student of Alex Krieger, no, but he always said, look at it the other way around. I, I would almost say, you could say that Wakatan went north. It actually developed pretty heavily in the south and um, you know, the Cape Flatter area and then made itself north. Instead of the other way around, the linguists are trying to say the Wakatan family started up in Northern Vancouver Island for a number of reasons, but, but it could go the other way. Well, I don't. I don't think there's been enough work done anywhere on the coast. Yeah, no. But right now, for for the, the for the the chip quartzite bipolar stuff, the oldest dates for that stuff are actually up at Barkley Sound. They're not in Washington. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, like you say, we'll see it earlier anyway. Yeah. We see old cot sites mm -hmm. in the Flattery area at some point. <clears throat> yeah. I'm surprised you haven't found any. <laughs> you know, there are lithic assemblages along the shoreline, uh, shorelines of Lake Ozette, yeah. uh, by Tivoli Island. And uh, Dave Conker has told me about a couple of places down there, um, but they're only really accessible when the lake is low at the end of the summer, because they're just seeing them wow. on the exposed shoreline. and. Uh, he's, I've been in one or two places with him where I would bet money that if we got up on the terrace above the shoreline and started punching holes in the ground, we'd find more of the stuff, but you can't see it now. And uh, the park is not really pursuing those things. You know, the sites there are not subject to the same type of erosional loss that the middens on the outer coast are. The ones on the outer coast are getting smaller every year. 
because of wave energy and sea level rise. Oh. Well, we probably have time for another question. Does anybody have one more? Uh, I really want to thank Gary. He's the kind of person that is unique in doing this kind of really looking at the broader picture of all the, the characteristics of sites throughout Puget Sound, throughout Gulf, you know, uh, San Juan's and out the Straits. So, but uh, thank, thank you so much for uh, presenting this amazing work. And I, I, yeah, like I say, I think it's just an expansion of uh, the fact. And you're, you're, Gary, in fact, has had the longest uh, relationship with Macaw tribe as uh, helping them with their archaeology, which is quite, uh, quite commendable and uh, uh, I'm sure an honor too to be. Oh, it's a privilege. I, I am yeah. flattered that, that, uh, to have that relationship. And, and, I, uh, Macaws, when they saw this on Facebook, like Stephanie and Polly McCarty, I don't know if she's here, but uh, really wanted to come in and hear you. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate the opportunity. And, and like I say, hopefully sometime, you know, we're really delayed by the pandemic, but hopefully we will get the White Rock and Toliak assemblages done in the next couple of months. And maybe sometime early next year, we'll actually have a publication on this stuff. Hopefully. No promises, but hopefully. <laughs> and I know you're doing some other interesting work, so we may come back to you to see if we can get you back on. No more questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but thanks so much. And, uh, thanks, Gary. Yep. Good night, everybody. And uh, right. we got nope. James oh, Dick, Dixon. I'll, Stephanie, I'll send you Ed's phone number. He, he likes visitors. Yep. yep. Okay. See you. And, uh, oh, we got some other Rosetters. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Bye, Gary. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.